Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Guiding you to financial freedom is my co-host today, Matthews Barnett. Hi, Matthews. How's it going? Today's podcast is, I guess, in celebration, we'll call it that, of campaign season. Uh, We're looking at the Biden campaign's tax proposals, and we want to compare that with the Trump tax proposal, which uh, ironically, there is no official tax proposal. Should he be reelected? It's because in 2017, he already got his tax agenda fully in place. So today we'll do a little compare and contrast of the two policies. Let's start off with corporate tax rates. Yeah, corporate tax rates are currently set to increase. Under the Trump administration, they were at 21%. Currently for Biden's proposal, it would be increased to 28%. And he really wanted to stop companies from not paying any taxes at all and shut down some of those loopholes. So there would be a 15% minimum tax regardless. You know, that, that's interesting. There's, there's been a lot of articles in the Wall Street Journal recently about that very tax policy. If you look at the S&P 500, S&P 500 is the, some of the 500 largest companies here in the U.S. If we increase corporate tax rates from 21 to 28%, that's going to reduce corporate earnings by 9.2% according to the Bank of America Global Research Team. So obviously, I, that gives me pause, especially during a COVID environment where really it's the tech companies that are leading this charge in the market. We talk about that in our market update, even during the COVID update, that technology stocks, not just Facebook, Alphabet, and Amazon, but the software companies, right? They've all been pulling the averages up. If you're invested in other sectors of the market by themselves, you wouldn't have the rate of return that you have today without having the technology sector, which is about 21% of the S&P 500. So, you know, that gives me some pause. Is that something we really want to do? And the thing about it is he's he's actually targeting the tech industry. Because when he talks about the overall economy, he says he wants to talk about the real economy as if tech stocks are not real. Even though they're the biggest part of the economy. Even though they're the biggest part of the economy right now. I think maybe for his generation, it doesn't seem real. Him and Trump are are part of the same generation. And I'm I'm sure at times technology is uh, very foreign to them. But the other thing you talked about, Matthews, before we got on the air was, was the foreign tax as well. So what is Biden's proposal on the foreign tax? Yeah, so currently it would be taxed at the top rate of 21%, which is twice the current rate. I know you just mentioned just public companies in general. But, um, you know, you start increasing these taxes, you would think it affects the net earnings, which could trickle down into your retirement accounts because a lot of times you're invested into these companies. Well, not only that, but I go back to picking on technology stocks by the Biden campaign where you've got tech stocks derive 43 percent of their income from the U.S. So majority of their incomes coming from overseas through ad sales and, you know, how they make money here. They make it the same uh, in foreign markets. The S&P 500, the other sectors, they get about 60% of their revenue from the U.S. Still a big deal for them, but not as big it is uh, as it is for tech stocks. And I also add that the this is not quite in the tax code necessarily, but the antitrust laws, they're challenging Facebook and whether it should be owning Instagram. They want the ability to approve or disapprove of mergers and acquisitions, much like they would do with a bank or an airline, basically just really trying to come down hard on one of the fastest growing segments in the world. That gives me a lot of pause in how they're handling that, especially because how does that translate to a person putting money in their 401k every week? Well, it's your rate of return, right? Anyway, let's move on down to small business. The small business tax would be increased as well um, at the highest tax rate uh, currently for Trump would be uh, 29.6, and that could increase under Biden's proposals to 39.6%. And then we've got a a 12.4% increase on income over $400,000. If you're a business owner, net income of over $400,000, basically you'd have to keep paying um, another 12.4% on on top of that, where normally it would stop at $137,000. That's a significant increase because overall, just federal taxes, that puts it up to closer to 52%. Majority of businesses in America are small businesses or deemed small businesses. And you kind of wonder, you know, if, if the business owners are going to get taxed by the more they make, is there a point at which they aren't incentivized to grow and create jobs for the economy? Uh, I think that's probably up to each individual person at some point, but certainly I wouldn't want to create incentives for companies not to be growing. 
well, especially small businesses in the U.S., that's why the PPP was so important. They actually produce almost 50% of our workforce and uh, basically the same in our GDP, like you mentioned. So that's the majority of, of businesses is, is small business. Let's move on down to 401k plans. What does the Biden camp propose in, under the 401k changes? Yes. Yeah, so his current proposal is he would get rid of the current deductions and have a credit for your contributions. So currently, if you're at the marginal tax rate of 35%, there would be, let's say, a 20% tax credit instead of the deduction. So the tax savings on your maximum contribution of 19500 would decrease from 6852 all the way down to 3900 Let's make sure everyone follow, follows that. If you're putting money into a 401k pre-tax, that's not, not talking about the Roth right, 401k. Right, just traditional pre-tax. Pre-tax, meaning you, if you put in nineteen five, it's like you're not earning nineteen five. You're saving it for your future self. So you get a tax deduction, right? A tax, a tax re- reduction in what you owe because you're hiding that nineteen five until uh, retirement. Now, what he's proposing is that you put in nineteen five into your four hundred one k, but you don't get a full deduction over certain income thresholds. Do we have that income threshold? Everything I've seen is the twenty percent tax credit, and that's based off the thirty five percent marginal tax rate. So it seems like for the higher tax brackets, this will be hitting them, and then maybe the twenty twenty percent and below, it's it would kind of even out. So twenty, you get to deduct twenty percent of what you put away. That's going to be very interesting. Well, it's not deduct; it's a credit, or so a credit. it's not that's a deduction. True. So yeah. you get applied to that. That's worse. <laughs> That's going to be very interesting on how that even gets administered. Because if, if you have money in your 401k already and you're deferring it, you may be deferring money that you don't, that you don't, and you're actually getting to deduct. So there's had to be a lot of math there. Like you would probably want to contribute more to a Roth as, at a certain point. <laughs> everyone will, uh, if this were to happen, everyone will, uh, I'm sure, rushing to create calculators to figure out the optimal way to save. I guess what bothers me is the fact that the campaign is certainly reducing our incentive to put money away, certainly for 20% of the population that has the capability of ma- easily maxing out a 401k. It's definitely for the higher earners and, and trying to find reduce the, some of these loopholes for right now. All right, let's move on to talk about capital gains. So let's describe that. So if you have a capital gain is outside of your, your retirement account, say you buy Coca-Cola stock at $10.00 it appreciates to 20 and you sell it, you would pay capital gains on the $10 gain. Correct. But it would not be included like an ordinary income tax, which is higher. So there's some benefits to the capital gains tax. Currently, if you're making between 40000 and 441000 most Americans are in that 15% bracket. So that's the capital gains tax currently. If you're making over 250000 currently, there's what's called the net investment income tax, which is an additional 3.8%. So currently, the maximum you would pay on capital gains is 23.8%. Under the new uh, proposal from Biden, that rate goes to 39.6, and then there's that additional net investment income tax as well. So the overall capital gains ends up around 43.4%, which is an ordinary income tax, basically. So not much incentive to sell, certainly at that point. Or if you did have to sell, you're going to be greatly penalized for it compared to where we are today. Now... Generally, and this is a strategy that we have. If if you're retired under a hundred thousand dollars a year in income, you can generally get zero percent capo gains. You don't really have any earned income, so I don't see that changing. So I think in retirement, that the, the probably doesn't really affect you that much. Again, it goes back to the new proposed tax code really seems to target four hundred thousand plus a year in income. Right. This is definitely uh, so far at least it looks like aimed at the the higher income earners. Okay. Let's shift a little bit toward estate planning. I think a big surprise to me was the removal of step up and basis. And that affects everybody at every level. If you're dirt poor and you inherit mama's house and you sell the house and she paid 40000 for it and you just sold it for 200 if there's no step up in basis, normally upon death, the home gets revalued. You sell the home for 250 It was valued at 250 There's no tax due. And my example, if you paid forty for it, sold it for two fifty, you'd have to pay tax on two hundred ten thousand dollars. That's a big deal, especially when it wasn't coming from pocket; it was inheritance. You know, it's. I think a lot of people think it would be probably from stocks and the increase in stocks that you inherit, but uh, a lot of Americans are inheriting homes and other things that have value like that, where the the step up in basis is pretty crucial. And then for wealthy families, having 
not having a step up in basis and you've had individual stock in your family for years or you're an executive, you earned stock throughout your career, sometimes you hold on to that knowing that your children can get it, they can liquidate it if they want, really no tax issues there. And that's gone away. That changes planning dramatically. That does. That could be some generational planning right there where you are, those appreciated stocks you can pass down. Um, This would definitely have an effect on that. Tell me about the, the death tax. A lot of people don't even understand it to begin with, but where are we currently if, if you die and you leave your remainder of your estate goes to your children? What is the current tax right now? Yeah. So the, the state tax or the death tax, as you call it, when you pass away over a certain threshold, you would pay the 40% taxes. But right now it's $11.58 million per person. So not an issue for most people. Right. It's over $22 million for a couple. And Biden is proposing... Back to pre-Trump era of 50% reduction, back to around the $5 million. So husband and wife, you still have to be net worth over $10 million before you worried about estate tax. Right. And historically, that's still pretty high regardless the $5, five million was. So the thing is, this was still sunset in 2026. So families that did have this as an issue have had a few years to go ahead and start planning for this. And even if Biden was elected, you would think they would be able to plan for this as well. So it's a different planning opportunity, I guess. And if you're single, your net worth is over $5 million, you pass away, the amount over $5 million gets taxed at what percent? The 40% is the state tax currently. So 40% of your assets above $5 million would go to the government. Right. I haven't seen anything uh, about any increases in that. And it's not as radical as Bernie and Elizabeth Warren's plan with the wealth tax. So this isn't a wealth tax. This has always just been, regardless of the number, there's, there's been some type of death or estate tax. There are some positive sides to this plan. One I found was the child tax credit. Yep. They expanded the child and dependent care tax credit. So that goes from 3000 to $8,000. Correct. So it could be up to 16000 for multiple dependents. And that also increased the maximum reimbursement rate from 35% to 50%. And then we have a first-time homebuyer credit as well. Correct. That's returning since the Great Recession. It would be a maximum of $15,000 for first-time home purchasers. And that would actually be refundable and advanceable in order to assist the buyers at the time of purchase uh, instead of having to wait till the actual to file your taxes. So then the big one is income tax. Really, what I'm seeing on the income tax change from Biden is if you make over $400,000 a year, you're going to pay a lot more in tax. But really below 400000 is pretty much status quo, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah. And there's some additional things, like we said, like the tax credit, the home buyer credit. He's also proposed a refundable tax credit for health care insurance premiums to limit family spending on premiums to no more than 8.5% of their income. So there are some additional things he's added for lower income earners. But yeah, the bigger increases are over the, the 400000 threshold. You Generally, people above $400,000 are business owners. I certainly have pause with taxing them more, uh, especially in this in this environment. Some of them may have fallen below that amount, especially restaurant owners, right, based on COVID and some other industries based on COVID. Other industries are doing very well in COVID and obviously uh, seems to be targeted at those, certainly at those industries. What's interesting is what I kind of learned from this, there's a movie out, it is called The The Social Dilemma. And I watched the movie and it talks about how we get manipulated through social media. And it's very interesting because when I actually went and pulled down the Biden tax laws from these various sources, it wasn't nearly as bad as what my Facebook feed tells me it is. Right? Right. <laughs> Not targeted to you to have... Uh... Yeah. And so that, what, you know, I think the lesson to be learned here is, is you, you don't get your news, you don't get your campaign information from your social media feeds. Those social media feeds are manipulated just to you. In fact, I get very few pro-Biden feeds on, my, on any of my social media. Well, Twitter maybe, but Twitter's just a bunch of angry people. That's what I've determined. Everybody on Twitter is angry. Everybody on uh, Instagram is- Keyboard warriors. <laughs> warriors. <laughs> yeah. Everybody on Instagram is, I don't know what that is. And then Facebook's a totally different group of people. We're getting manipulated. We, we have to pay attention to what what's true and find the facts ourselves. So digging into the Biden tax plan, again, a lot of it is, there's no details, what we tell you is pretty much all that they have said and asking for de- more detailed questions or answers to their reporters' questions that they don't explain anything. They want it very general anyway. And that's just for Biden. Like we said, Trump hasn't put out anything and, since his, yes. his recent proposals that and, he's done. And Trump, you just have to say, well, that's just the current, it's just the current environment because that's what he wanted, which 
I would argue is working pretty well up until the layoffs and COVID and, and things like that. But we have to focus on what truth is. My biggest concern on the Biden plan is, you know, they talk about fair share. Everyone needs to pay their fair share, which ironically, in my opinion, I, that'd be more of a flat tax. If everyone wants to pay their fair share, just call it 15% across the board and everyone pays it. We haven't talked about that in years, the flat tax. I guess they just abandoned the whole concept. I think that we have to pay attention to what's true and who is being taxed and why do people who make $400,000 more have to essentially part with 43% of income? And how does that affect their businesses? Because they have less money in the pocket, they hire less people. I mean, that's what we've always been told. A lot of the stats on that are true, but it's not detrimental. It doesn't sink the country. It just means slower growth. It's, it's just like the uh, Obama years, right? We had a good economy, but it was a very slow growing economy, partially for that reason. Top end was very heavily taxed. And I think it's important to figure out where all this income is going to go from the changes in tax code. That'd be trillions of dollars. And from reducing the, or for increasing those taxes and reducing those loopholes and havens, it sounds like it would go to Biden's proposal for this this infrastructure and the net zero greenhouse emissions. So when they're increasing the taxes, where would that, that savings or where they're going to implement this? Well, I guess that's what he's talking about. When he says the real economy, the antitrust talk about tech, talking about real jobs or the Obama administration, I think, called them shovel ready jobs, which were in the end, not really shovel ready. But he's called it about real jobs, building bridges and things like that. If you have a tech job, that job's not real is, is what they're implying. They haven't said that. So and also, too, you know, they're, they're starting to see the tech industry just grow and grow and become more influential. And the government doesn't really have a stronghold on it. So what are they going to do about it? So I don't know. Hopefully everyone can formulate their own opinions on who they think should be taxed and how much they tax they should be paying. That's not for me to decide. Our job here is to build portfolios and last through any administration and give tax advice on how to navigate through any, any possible changes. The good news is, as indexers, it doesn't really matter who wins the White House from an investment standpoint. Yes, there could be some volatility as things shift, but when you own an index fund, you're owning pretty much everything. You're not betting on any one particular industry. That's important to remember. We have to keep level heads through this. Now, are there other issues such as tax that are very you're very passionate about and that's why you should choose a candidate? Absolutely. But for us here when we're managing assets, statistically, I mean, Vanguard reported this uh, a couple months ago, or I guess it was last month. Uh, it doesn't matter. Volatility was the same before the election, the same after the election. Like you mentioned, emotion. You might be emotional about that, but it's important to, regardless of your political views, just remain invested. There could be some volatility, but we'll find out soon enough about you know who's elected and, and how this changes. Yep. I don't think any candidate is saying that they need to tear down the free market system. There was a candidate that was borderline that. I had serious concerns about a, a Sanders uh, run where we're just going to rip apart the free market system, but neither candidate that we have now would derail that free market system. So, all right, man. Uh, thanks for your time. Appreciate we'll see you it. next podcast. Thank you. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.